here talking about Pope Francis, the year of mercy. What is this year of mercy? How do we live it? And we've been examining the theme of mercy a lot through the Gospel of Luke. Uh, but I want to share with you a fun story from uh, an encounter I had with, with Pope Francis just a, a few months ago. Uh, I've gone to Rome many times, leading many pilgrimages. And in this particular year, we got to, up to the front row for the papal audience on the Wednesday, which often happens with our group. And I had my nine-year-old son with me, little Carl, and I, he came along on the pilgrimage. And we were in the front row, and the Pope came by, and you saw him kiss a baby. And then he's driving by in the Pope mobile. Then all of a sudden, Pope Francis just stops right in front of us, and he points at my son, Carl. And the next thing I know, these Swiss guards come over, grab Carl, and put him over here in the Pope mobile. And then the Pope goes back and kind of taps him on the head, gives him a little kiss. And I thought, oh, wow. I mean, I've seen him take babies before. I've never seen him take a nine-year-old. But OK, that's kind of nice. And then all of a sudden, the Pope mobile drives away with Carl. <laughs> this is supposed to be the year of mercy. And the Pope just kidnapped my son. And he's driving around for like 20 minutes all around St. Peter's Square. And I'm wondering, how am I ever going to see Carl back? Well, eventually, he dropped him off in the front. And Carl's coming back, and he's walking along the front. And all these you know, people from all these different countries are just giving him high fives as he's going down the line. <laughs> so amazing things happen, I guess, in the year of mercy. You know, one really big area of mercy, I'm hoping the, the graces will overflow uh, and, and touch my heart, is... Um, I'm a Cubs fan. <laughs> and uh, this morning, I woke up at 3.45 in the morning and I, you know, to catch a 6 o'clock flight out of Denver. And it was about a month ago I realized that my assistant booked the flight through Chicago. And my folks have been trying to have my boys come out and visit. I'm from Chicago area originally. And so we schemed that I would take Paul and Carl and Luke and they'd come with me and I'd, I'd, they would come on the plane and then and when we land in Chicago, I'd drop them off you know, through security, wave to my mom on the other side of security and, uh, and then I'm going to meet up with them Saturday night when I fly back on my way back and then Sunday, we're going to go to Wrigley Field and I've not been there, I can't tell you, since 1991, I think. And, uh, and I'm hoping that this year will be a year of mercy for, for Cubs fans. But I have to realize, while you know, being a Cubs fan, there's, there's a lot of Catholic you know, ethos in being a Cubs fan because there's a great theology of suffering. <laughs> the only difference between Catholic suffering and Cubs suffering is that um, Catholic suffering is redemptive. <laughs> Cubs suffering is just pointless. But we're not here to talk about the Cubs. We're here to talk about the year of mercy. And, and, and as I think about this, you know, wh what is mercy? When I think about mercy, I'm reminded of that little kid's game. Do you know that kid's game of mercy where two children may put their hands together like this and it becomes a tournament of strength and one tries to overpower the other one and, 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 and break the arm of the other one and the only way the game ends is if the weaker child cries out, mercy! And as a kid growing up, that's what I thought God's mercy was all about. <laughs> you know, that we're... You know, God is up there, the all-holy, all-powerful, all-good God, and, you know, we make mistakes, we sin, we're wretched sinners, and what we need to do is cry out, mercy, so that we don't go to hell. And then God, if he hears our cry and we cry loud enough, then he'll pardon us and he'll let us into heaven. That was kind of the, you know, skewed concept I had of mercy, and, and sadly, I think many people have that, that they think mercy is just about one powerful person, uh, just pardoning a weaker person, saying, well, okay, I'll overlook what you did, and I'll, I'll let you get by, and I'll just declare you innocent. But that's not a Catholic understanding of mercy. It's certainly not a biblical understanding of mercy. Mercy is much more an expression of God's love for us. The God who is love created us freely out of love. He created us so that we can participate in his love. And even though we have turned away from him over and over again in many thousands of small ways and some big ways. Even though we turn away from him, he constantly seeks us out because he's so madly in love with us. Some of the great saints, when they reflect on just how much God loves us, they just say, God is mad. St. Catherine of Siena said, you are a mad lover. You are drunk with love. 
He loved us so much, he sent his own son to die for us and to restore us to unity with him. He gave us the church. He gave us the teachings. He gave us the sacraments. And he wants to constantly go out and touch as many souls as possible with his mercy. You see that in Jesus' own public ministry, don't we? He's constantly going out. He's moving from one village to the next, from one person to the next, going to all the dark corners of Israel, all of those that were the outcasts, all those that were lonely, all those that were suffering, doing as much as he can because he just wants to be at one with us. He is so driven by his love. And it's that great mercy of God that Pope Francis is drawing our attention to in this particular year of mercy. Now, Pope Francis, when asked, why, why this year? Why is this year a year of mercy? He said this, he said, ours is a time of mercy. Ours is a time of mercy. He said, yes, I believe that this is a time of mercy. The church is showing her maternal side, her motherly face to a humanity that is wounded. She does not wait for the wounded to knock on her doors. She looks for them on the streets. She gathers them in. She embraces them and takes care of them and makes them feel loved. Now, why, why is this such a time of mercy? He mentioned something about humanity being wounded, and I want to elaborate on that. Uh, in many of his writings, Pope Francis has talked about this idea of a wounded humanity. Why is humanity wounded? Listen to what he says. Humanity is wounded, deeply wounded. Either it does not know how to cure its wounds, or it believes that it's not possible to cure them. And it's not just a question of social ills or people wounded by poverty. Relativism wounds people. All things seem equal. All things appear the same. Now, let's think about this for a moment. As it, the secular modern world has turned away from truth turned away from the gospel, turned away from traditional values. We can't even get bathrooms right anymore. As we've turned away from truth and embraced this relativism, that there's no truth, everyone just does whatever they want, there's no right or wrong, that just, it's not just that we've, we, we're, we're no longer getting religious teachings right. It, we, we can't even get the basics of human life right. As Pope Benedict often said, when we turn away from these gospel values and traditional values, we lose the art of living. We no longer know how to live. And isn't that true? You know, if there's no right or wrong and we just tell everyone just do whatever you want, then we don't live marriage well. We see marriages suffering so much. Think about how many people have been wounded in their broken marriages. We don't live family life well. And so, so many people wounded because of broken family life. Young people don't know how to live dating relationships well. They don't know how to live out their sexuality in a proper way. And so they experience great pain, the great heartache, great insecurity, feeling used, disillusioned about whether they can ever find a lasting love. Is marriage even possible? Humanity is deeply wounded. We don't know how to live friendship, live in community, care for the poor, care for those in need. Humanity is wounded, deeply wounded, Pope Francis says. And that's why he's calling on a year of mercy so that we can go out into the world with the truth and the love of Jesus Christ. In the end, this is all a part of Pope Francis' desire for evangelization, to bring souls closer to Jesus Christ and to the fullness of the Catholic Church. But we have to realize that we can't just go out with the truths of the faith. The truths of the faith always have to be accompanied by mercy. You know, one of Pope Francis's favorite images for the church is that of a field hospital, a hospital out on a battlefield. And, and when, you, when, you have, when you're out on a battlefield, you've got somebody, you know, that has a severe injury. You know, they've been shot in the chest. They have a, a ruptured spleen. When, when, the, when, when these it, seriously injured people come into the field hospital, the doctor doesn't go up and say, hey, I think we need to talk about your cholesterol level. You know, oh, I, I think I need, we need to, you know, let's talk about your blood, your blood sugar level and how much are you exercising? Can we talk about your diet? No, you, those are important things, right? Don't get me wrong. But you got to deal with the most urgent matters first. And Pope Francis says, 
we need to do the same thing when we're talking to people from our secular, relativistic culture. That we may be talking about, about some very important issue, like the definition of marriage or contraception or whatever the issue is, very important issues, but we gotta realize that behind those issues there's also a person that very likely is deeply wounded by the culture. They don't know God's love, they don't know how merciful God is, how willing God wants to forgive them, how much God wants to help them in their lives. And, and, and we've got to address the most urgent matters first. And if they don't know the story of God's love, then they're not, it's going to be very difficult for them to make sense out of all these other important moral issues that are a direct consequence of that story. But if they don't know the heart of the gospel, then they're, they're not really going to listen to us well. I remember talking to my asthma doctor recently. She was asking me about this image of the field hospital. And I said, it's kind of like this. You know, let's say there's some kid, one patient of yours, who's severely allergic to dogs. They get a really bad asthmatic attack if they play with dogs. And let's say this little boy happens one day to play with a really furry dog, has a, a horrendous asthmatic attack, can't breathe. They have to rush him to the ambul in an ambulance to the hospital. When he comes in, is the first thing you're going to say to him, hey, don't you know you're not supposed to be talking to dogs? You're playing with dogs? No. You're first, you've got to get the kid breathing first. You get the kid breathing, then, then we can talk about the other things. And so Pope Francis, in this year of mercy, is drawing our attention to mercy so that we can go out to the world more effectively with mercy. And what I want to do in our short time together is to offer you a few practical ways to put the year of mercy into your life so that we can be more effective witnesses to the fullness of the gospel in sharing the truth and the mercy of Jesus Christ uh, to a world that desperately needs it. So can we start with a Hail Mary before we jump in? Let's ask Mary's intercession for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So the context of where I want to go, I want you to see the end, the telos, the main goal here. It's evangelization. It's to bring souls to the fullness of the truth, the fullness of the gospel, Jesus Christ and his church. But to do that, we're going to step back from the culture and look within. Because sometimes we think about, you know, this year of mercy. Well, oh, wow, you know, we, there's, so much, there's so many troubles in the world, and, and the world needs mercy. And that's true. But we can look at it, the year of mercy detached. We say, oh, yeah, we need mercy uh, given what's happened in France and Germany recently, the world needs mercy. Or we see what's happening in the Middle East, the world needs mercy. Or what happened in Orlando or Dallas or Baton Rouge, you know, our, our country needs mercy. And, and we see what's going on, the culture is falling apart, the culture needs mercy. And we can look at it like that, detached. But what I want us to do is get really personal here and see that, you know who needs mercy first? Me. I want us to look into our own selves. Because we're never going to be effective witnesses to God's love and mercy and truth unless we've encountered it profoundly ourselves. So let's take a look at that aspect of mercy uh, for ourselves. Pope Francis is calling us for a re to have a renewed encounter with Christ's mercy. A renewed encounter with Christ's mercy. And I think this is important for those of us that are especially, you know, we're, we're very on fire about our faith. And we can sometimes forget this. Again, we can often think, yeah, well, those people out there, Planned Parenthood, they need mercy, and all these other groups need mercy. But, but we can often forget how much we really need mercy. And, and I can understand that because, look, if we're faithful Catholics, we, you know, if we believe in God, just the fact that if we believe in God, you know, wow, we stand out. Our faith is important to us. We stand out in our culture. And I, and I could actually just say, wow, you know, I, I, I go to church on Sunday. Now I, I'm, I'm, I'm really part of the elite. You know, I'm really religious. You know, I go to church on Sunday. And not only that, guess what? I, I believe all the church's teachings. I'm orthodox. Whoa, now you're putting yourself in the tiny, you know, small percentile of, of, of people out in the universe right now. You know, so I believe all the church's teachings. And, and, and I strive to follow them. And, and I'm involved in my parish. And we can kind of pat ourselves on the back saying, 
I'm doing a lot better than a lot of people out there. I mean, those people, they really need mercy out there. I mean, I'm sure, I know I need mercy too, but, you know, but I'm not as bad as all of them. You know, I'm pretty good because I follow all the rules. You know, I'm, 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 I'm a pretty good Catholic. And, and we can fall into this trap, can't we? But let, let's just think about that. Does, does simply following the rules, being orthodox, it's absolutely essential. But is that enough? Is that enough? I mean, if, if I told you, you know, I'm an amazing basketball player. What if I told you that? I'm an amazing basketball player. And you said, why? Well, well, Ted Sri, tell me, what, what makes you a great basketball player? And I said, because I follow all the rules. <laughs> I'm really good at following the rules. I, I, I don't go out of bounds. I don't double dribble. I don't travel with the ball. I'm an amazing LeBron would want me on his team. You say, no way. I mean, it's good. Don't get right. You know, you need to follow the rules. That's important, right? It's absolutely essential. But in the end, that's just permission to play. That's just the starting point. If you don't have the skills of dribbling, shooting, boxing out, all these kinds of things, you're, you're not going to be a great basketball player. And the same is true. We've got to follow the Ten Commandments. We have to believe what the Catechism teaches. We have to follow the church. Absolutely. But that's just the beginning. The Christian life isn't just about following the rules. It's about following Jesus Christ and imitating him. How are we growing in our imitation of Christ, taking on his qualities, his virtues, striving for holiness? That's what the Christian life is all about. And when I, if I'm comparing myself just to people out there in the world, that's, that's not the standard. The standard's right here. And all I do is have to take one glance there and say, I need a lot of mercy. I need a lot of mercy. It reminds me of my, my daughter, Josephine. I think I might have shared this story last year with you, but because it, it happened just last summer around this time. My little daughter, Josephine, she's five, very vibrant and curly hair and just energetic and just, you know, just full of energy. And one day we left her with a babysitter and, the, the ba and there were other kids that were over and she was, you know, piling on the other kids, getting a little rough with them. And the babysitter just happened to say, uh, Josephine, don't be so rough. And then my, my daughter jumped out of the pile really quick, the babysitter told us. She jumped out and went like this. And the babysitter said, what, is everything okay, Josephine? She goes, I'm really trying to be good. And the babysitter just kind of smiled and said, how's it going for you? And she just almost started to cry and said, it's really hard. <laughs> Isn't that true, though, for us, if we're really striving to be good? It's not about, oh, I went to church, and I believe the things in the catechism. I'm pro-life. I'm pro-marriage. Yay, great. But are we striving to be good? Are we really trying to imitate Christ? Because if we are, we're going to realize how much we need his help, his forgiveness, his mercy, his mercy. Now, when... Uh, some of the things that keep us from recognizing our need for God isn't just following rules and, and kind of holding on to that as our security blanket, but it's also sometimes we're just afraid to change. We're afraid to admit how much we need God's help. We, we don't want to have to change our lives. We kind of like coasting as we are. You know, so our, our conscience, you ever have your conscience kind of tell you, like, ooh, maybe I shouldn't have said that to my spouse that way? Or, oh, maybe I didn't handle that situation with my, my child the best way. Or maybe I shouldn't be looking at this on the screen. Or maybe I, 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 I should have handled this situation better with my colleagues at work. You know what I'm talking about? You kind of get your, your conscience kind of just, you know, kind of the Lord knocking on the door of your heart, getting you to think about something. And, you know, what do most of us do when that the voice of conscience comes up? You know, do we listen to it? Or do, we or do we suppress it? See, our modern world wants us to suppress our conscience. Our modern world says, hey, don't feel guilty. Guilty is a bad thing. You know, guilt, that's just a bad Christian thing. You Catholics are all caught up in guilt. And, you know, we shouldn't, have, we shouldn't be guilty. You, should, you know, we all have little mistakes. But we should just feel good about ourselves and even hug our shadow. And everything should be fine. And, you know, we all, you know, so just don't feel guilty. Guilt is a bad thing. But actually, we have to see, no, guilt is something good. When you feel guilty over something that you've done that's wrong, that's actually a good thing. You, what that means is there's some, there's some good part of me that doesn't resonate 
with the bad thing I just did. So if, if, I, if I'm just too short with my wife, I didn't treat her well in a certain exchange, and then I feel badly about it afterwards, that's a really good thing. That means there's a good part of me that didn't like the bad thing I just did. But if I didn't have that guilty feeling and I treated my life horribly and I like it, that's actually a really bad thing. <laughs> that's what you call a jerk. <laughs> and I don't want to be that. So we want to let that good voice, we want to let that speak, let that come out. You know, too often what we do is we tend to, many people, we tend to rationalize our sins and just justify, oh, it's okay, it's not that big of a deal, or we make excuses for ourselves, or we, we blame other people for our problems, or we just distract ourselves, keep us really, really busy and constantly on our phones so we don't have to stop and think about our lives and where we're going. But that voice of conscience is still there. We want that voice to come out. Let's take time. If you sense the Lord touching your heart saying, you're struggling here. Or I want this to change. Let's let him speak. And that requires humility. That's what we're really talking about in this first point. That recognition of our need for God's help, our need for God's mercy. That's humility. And I mentioned this in the talk earlier today. You know, we all talk about humility, right? We all know about humility. If I gave you all a quiz, if I gave you a quiz right now, and the quiz question was, do you need God's help in your life? Do you need God's mercy? What are you all going to say? I, I bet every one of you are going to say yes on a quiz. And that's good. But that's what I like to call intellectual humility. But experiential humility, the humility that the saints write about, is much more profound. It's not just, oh yeah, I know I'm a sinner and I have concupiscence and I make mistakes and I need God's mercy, I need confession. and you know, that, That's just all up here. I'm talking about at the core of our being, do we, are we utterly convinced of how much we need God and his help moment by moment I mentioned this afternoon in my workshop about how St. John uh, in John's gospel do you remember what Jesus says about without him how much we can do do you remember he says without me you can do about 50% is that what Jesus says he says without me you can do nothing are you convinced of that I mean, we all know that. Again, if I gave you a quiz, did Jesus say that? Yeah, do you agree with that? Yes, you get it, right. But are you convinced of it? I mean, when you walk into your workplace, do you have that attitude? Jesus, I give you my work today. Help me to give the best of myself in my work. Whether I'm working at the church or working at a hospital or working in a business office, am I asking for his help in my life? Or, 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 or wake up in the morning, I'm doing my morning for a Jesus. I need you to help me to serve my wife today. Help me to be the, the, the best husband I can be for her today. Jesus, I don't know how to handle the situation with my teenager. I don't know how to handle the situation with my top. Jesus, help me to be the dad I need to be for them. Do, you, do we have that attitude? Sometimes we just go through life and we, I, I know I need God, but I'm not turning to him, begging for his help, moment by moment, day by day. And when the good Lord sees us just kind of trying to do it all on our own, guess what he does? He lets us go. And we'll only go so far. But the saints, the great souls that are utterly humble, that recognize how much they're dependent on the Lord, those are the ones that God does great things in and through. And in this year of mercy, Pope Francis is challenging all of us, especially those of us within the fold, those of us who are part of the convinced minority, as Pope Benedict would say, uh, of the faithful Catholics. He's challenging us to renew our own encounter with mercy and recognize how much we need God's help. We have so many areas we need to grow in. We need his forgiveness. We need his saving grace in our lives. And that leads now to our second point that we can take away. And that is the actual encounter with mercy. So we recognize we need God's mercy. Now we need to experience it. And I want to talk about two pillars of mercy. Two pillars of mercy. On one hand, there's forgiveness. Forgiveness. And I think this is what most people associate mercy with. That they think, okay, well, if someone who's merciful, they're, they're very forgiving. They will forgive you. And that's an important point, that we can be forgiven. And this is good news for us, first and foremost, but it's also incredibly good news for people out in the world. I want to do a little exercise right now, okay? Close your eyes. Don't fall asleep, but close your eyes real quick. Close your eyes. And I want you to think about what is your most embarrassing sin Maybe some, some, the sin, you think it's your worst sin. Maybe it's something you did a long, long time ago. 
or maybe it's something you're struggling with right now, just think about what that is, and then keep your eyes closed. I want you to imagine if all of a sudden that hidden sin came out into the open, and everybody knew about it. Your spouse found out about it, your kids found out about it, your parents found out about it, your friends, your per fellow parishioners, your co-workers, everyone just knows about it. How would you feel? Maybe you'd feel just afraid. What are people going to think of me? What does this mean for my life now? Maybe you feel just totally embarrassed. Maybe it, you feel angry, angry at how it got out, angry that uh, uh, the way other people are looking at you. You're probably angry at yourself. Maybe you're self-condemning. And, and so just imagine this moment, and then all of a sudden, in the midst of this shame and fear and frustration, Jesus comes and sits right next to you. He holds your hand. He looks you in the eye. And he says, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. You can open your eyes because you know that story, don't you? That's the story from John's Gospel, chapter 8. The woman caught in adultery. All of a sudden, thrown before the Jewish leaders and Jesus publicly shamed she was probably experiencing all those kinds of emotions of fear, embarrassment, anger, and probably a lot of self-condemnation. Before anyone was throwing stones at her, she was probably throwing stones at herself. And right at that moment, Jesus came and said, I forgive you. I forgive you. This is the, 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 this is the, the love of God. This is how merciful he really is. And he wants, to, he wants to bestow that mercy upon all of us, especially in the sacrament of confession. And, and, and he wants it for us first and foremost, but there are so many people out there that really think that their lives can never change, that they're defined by whatever things they've done in their life and what they're doing now, and, and that they're unforgivable, unlovable. And we need to preach the good news that they can get a fresh start in life, just like that woman in John 8 did. Now, I mentioned I do pilgrimages to Rome. One thing I like to do is show people something in St. Uh, Peter's Basilica. If you look at the main altar, off to the right, there's this section where all these confessions are heard in all these different languages. You can go to confession in German, Polish, Portuguese, Spanish, Italian, and practically every day, hundreds of pilgrims come from all over the world to confess their sins in this part of the Basilica. And after you leave this area and you're walking back into the main part of the Basilica, there's this big mosaic depiction of a scene from the Gospels. It's the story of when Peter goes out on the boat and starts walking toward Jesus. Do you remember that on the Sea of Galilee? They're at night, they see Jesus coming, and then Peter starts walking toward him. And it's all exciting because he's walking on the water toward Jesus. But then do you remember what happens? He takes his eyes off of Christ. And, and he's distracted by the wind and the storm, and, and he starts to sink. And he's desperately crying out to Jesus, Lord, save me! And Jesus is reaching out to him, and he says, and he brings him back into the boat. Why is that image there, where all the confessions are heard? It's because that story is very much about what happens in confession. That similarly in our own lives, when we take our eyes off of Christ, then our lives, we start to sink. We're not, we're not on track anymore, but all we have to do is reach out to Jesus and say, Lord, save me. And you know what Jesus does in the sacrament of confession? He says, it's about time you confess that sin. I mean, it's been 30 years I've been sitting here waiting for you. No, no. He's there because he's not there to condemn. He's, his mercy is always reaching out. He just wants us to turn back to him. And so no matter what you may have done, or no matter what your children may have done, or your grandchildren, or your friends, or your coworkers, we have to know that no matter what we've done, no matter how many times we've done it, no matter how long we've been away, Jesus is waiting for us in this great sacrament. He just wants to restore us. But if that's all you knew about confession in this year of mercy, you'd really be missing out on a lot. Because forgiveness is only one aspect of mercy. There's a whole other aspect that a lot of people don't talk about, a lot of people aren't aware of, that you encounter in the sacrament of reconciliation. And that is the healing power of Jesus Christ that is made manifest there. All throughout his public ministry, you see Jesus forgiving people's sins, but he's giving sight to the blind, he's raising the dead, making the deaf be able to hear, the paralyzed walk. 
And that same Jesus wants to do the same thing with us. He doesn't just want to pardon us. He doesn't just want to forgive us. Yes, he does that. He reconciles us. But he wants to get at the roots of our sins. He wants to heal us. He wants to heal us of our own spiritual blindness. He wants to make us be able to hear him more. And those areas of our lives where we feel paralyzed, unable to change, he wants to make us walk again. And whatever's dying in our souls, he wants to come and raise. That's the Jesus we encounter in the sacrament. Pope Francis said, too many times we Catholics, we treat confession like the dry cleaner. I love that image. We treat the, 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 the confessional like the dry cleaner. You know, you, know, you get a little stain on your shirt, and you go bring it to the dry cleaner, and the dry cleaner removes the stain. That's what we think confession's about. I get a little stain on my soul. I sinned, and now, whoosh, nice and clean. And, and granted, we are forgiven. There is an aspect of that. But Pope Francis highlights a very important truth, that our sins are not just a stain on our soul. They're a deep wound. We cultivate bad habits. Our character is formed. And Jesus doesn't want to just remove the stain. He wants to get to the root problem. He wants to heal us. Jesus wants to come not just as a judge and pardon us. He wants to come as a physician. And he wants to heal us. So whatever you may be struggling with, maybe there's some addiction you struggle with. Maybe the, you lose your temper a lot. Maybe uh, there's, there, there's someone you just feel like, you, I just can't forgive them. Uh, or maybe you're... You find yourself judging people out. Whatever, whatever the, the issue you might have, go to Jesus in this year of mercy, especially in the sacrament of confession, and confess it not just to be forgiven, but to beg for his mercy to change your heart so that you can live ever more like him. Now, I want to move to another aspect of mercy, and that is how we treat the people around us, our neighbor. How do you respond when you notice someone else's faults. You, you notice, oh, they didn't go to Mass again this week. Wow, she's in a mood today. You know, they're not married, and I think they're living together. Oh, he voted for that political candidate? H how do you respond when you notice other people's weaknesses or faults, certain actions? You know, many times what we do is we set ourselves up as a judge. We set ourselves up as a judge. We see a certain fact, a certain little point, a, a data point, and then we just assume, oh, this is how it is. But Pope Francis and many of the great saints have been writing about how we often will see just certain facts, but we don't necessarily, no, we don't necessarily see the whole story. We don't see the whole truth. It reminds me of a true story. There was a young woman, professional, who was raised Catholic, but was no longer practicing her faith. She wasn't going to church on Sunday. But she had a couple Catholics that she worked with at this company, and they invited her to this woman's group Bible study that they were doing. And she liked going to the Bible study. She was good friends with the people and liked what she was learning. And, and the women in the Bible study, you know, they would invite her to Mass, and she didn't come. But they were all very, always very welcoming to her. But then one day, there was the, the topic came up of confession. And as soon as confession came up, this young woman just body language, just started closing up, and she was normally very outgoing. She didn't say a word that Bible study. As soon as it ended, she said, I gotta go, and they shouldn't stay out, hang out for the fellowship afterwards, and everyone's wondering what happened. The Bible study leader felt awful. She went to bed that night with a stomach ache, thinking, did I say something wrong? We've been trying to reach out to her. What happened? A and, you know, and so from the outside, it just looked like, you know, well, here's this girl. She just doesn't go to church and just doesn't want to hear about confession, and it just looks like, well, you know, she's got a problem. But the next morning, the young girl called the Bible study leader and said, hey, I'm really sorry. I know everyone's probably wondering why I left so abruptly, but I, I gotta be honest, that whole confession thing just really hit me hard. And you all know I, I, I haven't been to church in a long time uh, and I don't go to mass. In fact, I have, the last time I ever stepped foot in a Catholic church was in high school at my father's funeral. And then she just pauses she gets a little teary, and she says, I just haven't been able to forgive God for taking away my dad all these years. And then she went on and through some tears just said, but you all have been just so kind to me and such good friends, and you've shown me what the faith is really about, and I want to set things right with God. I heard you guys say that there's confessions at the church. Can you, can you tell me 
when does that happen? How, how does that work? I said, well, it's every Saturday. And then she says, I want to go this Saturday. Do you think you and all the other women in the study would come with me to the church to be there with me at that moment when I come back to the church? And I shared that story because I've heard so many stories like this where you just see a little data point. Young girl not going to church. One person doing this. And you just see that fact, but you don't see the whole story. Now, the whole story of the suffering that she went through losing her father doesn't take away. There's a real problem. She really needs to go to church. She should have never stopped going to church. But all of a sudden, you look at the situation a little bit differently. You can look at it with more compassion, a little more empathy, and realize part of the issue is addressing that, her, her sorrow over losing her father, not just missing Mass on Sunday is a moral sin. So our love for our neighbor has to always be that of a spirit of compassion and mercy and not quickly setting ourselves up as a judge. St. Catherine of Siena struggled with this, by the way. She often was really good at like, noticing people's faults, she, especially priests. And she thought she was just you know, really gifted at reading human nature. <laughs> Until God one day confronted her and said, you know, Catherine, all those insights you're getting about other people's weaknesses, those, those insights aren't coming from me. They're coming from the devil. That's what God told her. The devil is allowing you to notice their faults, to catch them just at that one moment, so that instead of responding to their suffering with compassion, you set yourself as a judge. So Catherine learned very quickly, and she wrote a lot about how we should always have great compassion on others and assume the best. You might see something, you know, and, and you know, she always said, you know, if anything, just say, well, there go I. I would do the same thing unless grace held me up. And to recognize we all have our own weaknesses. I think this is a huge point uh, to take away. This is something uh, St. Bernard of Clairvaux mentions, is that, you know, we, will, if, if we can't really have compassion on the people who annoy us, the frustrations we experience from certain people at our parish or our workplace or our family when they hurt us even. We can't have compassion on them until we recognize our own sins and our own weaknesses. You know, if, if we tend to be people that are critical and judgmental, we struggle with that, even if we don't say it, but we have it in our head, it's oftentimes because we haven't followed step one or two that we talked about tonight. We haven't really recognized our own weakness and how much God needs to be merciful on me. I haven't experienced God's own mercy with my life. If I truly experience how patient and gentle God is with me, and I truly know what a mess I am, then when I see someone else doing other things and promoting bad things in the culture, I'm less likely to just look at them and look down on them. I, 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 I see, well, he's been so patient with me, I, I'd probably do worse if it wasn't for my relationship with Christ. This is what St. Bernard Clairvaux says. Listen, the sound person feels not the sick one's pains. It is fellow sufferers that readily feel compassion for the sick and the hungry. You will never have real mercy for the failings of another until you know and realize that you have the same failings in your own soul. In other words, maybe I, you know, haven't committed adultery, or maybe I'm not looking at pornography like other people, but maybe I struggle sometimes with my glances and purity of heart, and so I might not have the exact same thing, but, there, but I have something of that in me. Or maybe I'm, I'm not pro-abortion, but how much do I actually go out and live in solidarity with the weakest members of society and care for people that are, that are suffering, that are lonely, and that are poor? Again, it's, not, it's much more severe to promote abortion, but, but, uh, but John Paul II pointed out it's that same individualistic spirit that leads individuals to just not care for others in great need that same attitude that neglects the poor is the, the, the attitude that builds the culture of death in promoting abortion, that we don't want to care for those that need our attention the most. So what have we seen so far? We need to understand that we need, we need to know we need God's mercy, humility in our lives. Secondly, we need to experience it, experience his forgiveness and his healing power. And if we do truly experience God's patience his gentleness, his compassion and mercy with me, and we experience his healing power in my own life, if, if that happens, then when I'm looking at my neighbor, I'm going to tend to be more gentle and compassionate with them as well. 
And now we go to a fourth step, and now we're moving toward evangelization. Now we go out and we give witness. We give witness to the love of Jesus Christ that we have experienced ourselves. How do we do this? I'm going to talk about two ways briefly. One is to encounter the poor. Pope Francis has drawn particular attention to service of the poor in his pontificate and in this year of mercy. Do we go out and really serve the poor? And I have to be honest, for me, you know, I've, I, I, in my own life, I know I've said, well, I'm a theologian, I'm doing all this great work. I, I focus on the spiritual works of mercy, and that's true, and I think every state of life will be different, every individual will be different. But all of us are called to do something to have contact with those in great needs. Pope Francis once said, he challenged us to do a lot more than just give money, to do a lot more than just write checks. He once was addressing a group of people, and he said, do you give alms? And they said, oh, yeah, yeah, we give alms. And he says, do you look them in the eye when you give alms? Oh, you know, I just throw them the coins. He says, then you haven't really encountered them. Do you give alms? Yeah, yeah, Father, we give alms. Do you, do you touch them? Do you talk to the poor? Oh, no, we just give them money. Then you haven't really encountered them. Pope Francis is calling us to not just give money, but to encounter the poor, to live a, a little bit in solidarity with them so that we grow in love. Pope Benedict says when we do this, when I go out and I actually am serving the poor, I have uh, some contact with them, I'm not just helping this poor man's condition. I'm not just helping him you know, clean his house or helping serve him some food and put food in his belly or, or handing him some money. There's a change that's happening on the outside indeed. He has a nicer house. He has more food or he has some more cash. There's a change happening out there. But Pope Benedict said, there's a change that happens in here when we do that. That we who've encountered Christ's own love, we can't help but want to go out and share that love with those in need. That's a true mark of a faithful Christian. Pope Francis says this is one of the key marks of orthodoxy in the early church, a key mark of, of Catholic identity in the early church. When St. Paul was checking, is my gospel message okay? Can I go off to the Gentiles? He said, amen, go for it. Just make sure you do one thing, care for the poor. And, and as Paul sets up all these communities around Asia Minor and into Greece and then ultimately in Rome, you get all these Christian communities that are living a countercultural lifestyle, very different from the pagan, hedonistic, self-centeredness of the world around them. And so when Paul and his communities are serving the poor, other Christians, or, or, or the people in pagan Rome are looking at, wow, we've never seen anything like that. And Pope Francis says we live in a similar time of an individualistic, hedonistic age that is just centered on myself, my own pleasure, my own entertainment, my own comfort. And now is the time that Christians, more than ever, need to give a countercultural prophetic witness to care for the poor. Now, whether that means you go help at a soup kitchen or you go visit a nursing home, you help someone that you know in your own community, a neighbor, a widow next door, whatever it is, it's going to look differently for all of us. But I think we can all be challenged to give a little more of ourselves personally to those in need. Last point is not just the corporal works of mercy, but we need to also share our faith. You can think of this as the spiritual works of mercy. And that's what this is ultimately leading to. You see, if we've truly encountered Christ, then we just want to share him with others. And it's not just I'm sharing some ideas about him, but if I've truly encountered his love and patience and his saving help, his, his grace healing me in my own life, then I, that's just good news I want to share with others. But I meet so many Catholics that say, oh, I'm just not so sure how to do that. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to say it. I'm not a theologian. Uh, I'm afraid. Well, guess what? It, it, this isn't that hard. This isn't rocket science. Jesus, there's gospel stories all the time about people who encounter Christ, and then they go off and tell others about it. Like, you know the story of the Samaritan woman? Remember her? Talk about a woman, she has a very colored past, all these different husbands, and Jesus comes to her, and she goes through a conversion. She comes to believe in Jesus as the Messiah. She goes to her community, the other Samaritans, and she starts telling them about Jesus. And she's a successful evangelist. These Samaritans come to believe in Jesus as the Savior of the world through her own witness. Isn't she incredible? Do you know why she was such an effective witness to the gospel message? It's because on her way back to her village, she stopped at the diocesan office for that workshop on evangelization. No! It's because she 
encountered Jesus, experienced something good, and just wanted to share it. Now, don't get me wrong, that workshop or further studies, all those things make you better. You get more effective. But if you experience something good, you want to share it. So let me ask you, how many of you have ever seen a, a good movie in the last year or two? Anybody see a good movie? Did you tell anyone about the movie? You did, how did you do that? That's amazing. Do you have a master's in film criticism? Did you study with Roger Ebert? I want to meet you. That's amazing. Or how many of you married here? Any married folks here? How many of you could say something wonderful about your wife? Your spouse? Yeah, keep your hands up. That's a, do, you, do you have like a master's in marriage theology? How did you do that? That's amazing. No, when you experience something good, you just want to share it with other people. And it's the same thing with the gospel. If you've, if you've really encountered Jesus and experienced his mercy in your life, which is forgiveness, but also his healing grace to change you, to bring you to a happier life, then that's just good news. You're, if you're convinced that a relationship with Christ and the Catholic Church makes a difference in your life, then you can share that with other people. And you don't have to be an expert. And this is where Pope Francis and John Paul II often talked about the ministry of accompaniment. If you, if you just love people, and whether it's your niece or your grandson or your, your, your friend at work, whatever it is, and, and you're accompanying them in life. You're not just coming in with, hi, I'm here to give you Catholic truth. But no, you're here to just love them. And, and, and you're involved in their life and you're, you're asking questions. Many of them have never had people ask questions about their life. I can remember when I was a young college student, um, some, a seminarian in my diocese took me out to, to, to breakfast. I'm sure he was recruiting me and all, looking back on it. But he, I remember he just asked me a simple question. He was, we're just catching up, and then all of a sudden he said, so Ted, tell me, are you happy? I never had anyone ask me that question. So yeah, yeah I'm happy, yeah, I know, grades are going well, I got a girlfriend, you know, I'm playing in a band at college, and yeah, things are, yeah, I'm happy. But that question haunted me. And all that day I kept wondering, am I really happy? And then for the next several weeks, I just kept wondering, am I really happy? And I started to realize, I'm not. Yeah, on the outside, I had a lot of good things going on. Again, good grades, girlfriend, friends, all this kind of stuff, you know, social, nice social life. But deep on the inside, while I was Catholic and going to church, Jesus wasn't first. And there was a lot of insecurity, a lot of fear. I, 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 I wasn't really happy. And that question led me to ask deeper questions about where my life was going. And it wasn't until eventually saying, no, I don't want Jesus to just be a part of my life. I want him to be at the center. But then things started to go in the right direction at a deeper, profound level. Have the confidence that if people aren't putting Christ first in their life, just know their hearts are restless, as St. Augustine says. They just are. No matter how confident they seem, how disregarding of religion they might seem, just know the truth. Their hearts are restless until they rest in God. Now, going out and talking about the faith, you, you, that, that's just getting the starters, accompanying them, asking questions, sharing about your own, you know, in, in that context, when they start bringing up something, a question about life, then you could share something from the faith that made a difference for you. But at some point, you're going to have to be ready, though, for the challenges that the culture is raising about the faith today. Because I hear from so many parents the same kind of story. Something about, you know, I, I raised my kids Catholic, or I sent them to Catholic schools, or I sent them to youth group, and then they got into high school, and they start wondering, hey, Mom, why do I need a church? You know, I, I believe in God. I'm a good person. You know, why do I need a church? And then they start saying things like, you know, I don't need religion. I could just be spiritual. Then they go off to college, and they come home one spring break, and they say, why is the Catholic Church so judgmental? Why is it so critical of, you know, all these other views and ways of life? We should just be tolerant and just all coexist. Then they graduate and they get married and, or no, they graduate, they get a job, find a boyfriend, a girlfriend, and then they start living together. And mom and dad say, hey, did you ever think about getting married? Well, who needs marriage? I mean, why bother? We got a job. We like each other. We, you know, we get along. Why, why do we need some certificate from a church? This is the culture we live in today. And we need to be equipped to answer those questions eventually. Maybe not on the first round, but eventually we've got to be able to, to go after those deeper questions that are in the culture. Uh, but first and foremost, we've got to be able to encounter God's mercy in our own lives so that we can just have a spirit of his mercy and love with the people around us, loving our neighbor well, and then give a witness in our care for those in great need 
and then most of all, give a witness to our own faith so we could be more effective in evangelization. We're out of time. I wish I could, I wanted to get into a couple more, I wanted to answer some of those questions I just threw out there uh, about why do I need a church? Why do we talk about morality? Uh, but I'll, let, I'll just defer you to this book that I wrote here called The Love Unveiled, The Catholic Faith Explained, where I, it's a walk through the faith that goes through those questions. Um, if you want an article that's based on my talk today, I wrote an article actually for Franciscan University uh, for their catechetical journal. Uh, it's called uh, Living the Year of Mercy. It's on my website, which is just my name, edwardsstreet.com, and I posted it on my Facebook page for all of you. So you can just take that. It's for free. Share that with any, anyone that that would be helpful with. Thank you.